So good day, dear colleagues. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. We gave it a couple of minutes for the participants to join. At the moment, we have about 30 participants. If there are more people coming in, we will start <clears throat> slowly and maybe there will be more colleagues joining us. A reminder that this webinar will be recorded and the video record will be available later at the YouTube channel of Vapor. Uh, so those of you who, those of your colleagues who plan, plan to attend it but couldn't make it in the last moment, they can later see the uh, video of this webinar. Uh, my name is Ksenia Kizilova. I'm chair of the Liaison Committee at the World Association for Public Opinion Research. And today I'm very happy to welcome you to the next uh, webinar of Vapor. This is the last webinar of Vapor before the summer break. We will resume then again in September. Uh, our today's webinar is a special event. It is organized jointly with the Global Barometer Survey, a cross-national public opinion research project that is dedicated to the study of political culture, values, attitudes, political behavior of uh, citizens around the globe. The Global Barometer Survey, or shortly the GBS, covers six world regions and represents in the service about 75% of the world population, that is about 100 participating countries. The structure of GBS is represented by six regional barometers, Afro-barometer, Arab barometer, Latino-Asian barometer, and <clears throat> Eurasia barometer, and African barometer. And today, we will, uh, our webinar is dedicated to one of them, the Eurasia barometer. Today, in this webinar, we will be presented with the overview of the newest findings of the latest round of Eurasia barometer. It was a seven-nation study, which was conducted in November of 2021. Uh, the survey took place a little bit a uh, few months before the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, so we assume that some kind, some attitudes might have changed since then. But nevertheless, to, we look together in this data to see if we can find their answers to uh, the questions of the present days. In this webinar today, we will have five presentations. The two first of them will offer a cross-country overview, and then three more presentations where our colleagues uh, who were directly involved into the data collection, they will present their national case studies from Kazakhstan, Armenia, and Georgia. After listening to all five presentations, we will have time reserved for questions and answers session and discussion. But given that our webinar is limited to about 90 minutes of time, uh, please do not wait till the Q&A. Once you have a question or a comment, you can use the chat function and post your feedback or question there and all our speakers they will also keep an eye on the chat so they will be answering you during the uh, course of the webinar. Having said that I would like to give the floor to our first speaker and the director of Eurasia Barometer Professor Kristen Herfer who is also the president of the uh, World Value Service Association. Kristen is not just a director but he is also the founder of the Eurasia Barometer so he will give us uh, informa uh, general information about the study and then some overview of political attitudes and behavior of citizens in post-Soviet countries of post-Soviet Eurasia. Please, Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, welcome, uh, colleagues and friends. Um, we uh, are presenting today uh, the new West Eurasia Barometer, uh, and as, you, as uh, some of you know, we are doing this political and social uh, survey studies in post-communist Europe and post-Soviet Eurasia. Uh, since um, many years. And uh, this is the most recent wave uh, from 21. Uh, and uh, it covers uh, Armenia, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, Russia, and Ukraine. The Eurasia Barometer is a non commercial, uh, non governmental sur survey organization, which is based at the Institute for Comparative Survey Research in Vienna. And the main aim of this uh, Comparative Survey Research Institute is to monitor our political, social, and economic transformation in the countries of post-communist Europe and post-Soviet Asia in their populations. <clears throat> so we covered in the past not only the current wave, but also Belarus, Hungary, Romania, Slovakia, Azerbaijan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
The Eurasia bar meter is one of the regional bar meters in, of the world. Uh, we are a member of the um, uh, GBS, the Glo uh, Global Barometer Survey Group. And this Global Barometer Survey Group is the umbrella organization for Arab Barometer, Afro Barometer, Asia Barometer, Latino Barometer, and also Eurasia Barometer. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we did seven countries and uh, uh, Armenia, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, Russia, Ukraine. And the fieldwork date was October to November last year. <clears throat> so we just um, uh, conducted the fieldwork uh, before uh, the war broke out uh, in this early this year. So this is a um, political and social survey which is measuring political attitudes and behavior in Russia, Ukraine, and other countries just before the war started. Uh, our partners are um, uh, the Center for Caucasus Studies uh, in Armenia. Dr. Hegine is here. Then uh, Gorbi in Georgia and um, Public Opinion Research Institute uh, in Kazakhstan which is covering Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, Opinia in Chisinau, Moldova, and Sesi in Russia, <clears throat> and Ukraine uh, Research Center Social Monitoring. The fieldwork was uh, between October and November last year. We are analyzing the adults and residents in these uh, countries. And um, we could not do the study in Azerbaijan, Belarus, Uzbekistan, because the questions were too sensitive and too critical. And our, our friends in this country said, uh, we, we cannot do it in Belarus, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan for obvious political reasons. We had several sponsors and I would like to emphasize that the main grant came from Taiwan, from Academia Sinica. We were grateful for the support. <coughs> and these questions which we're presenting today will also be asked in other parameters, Asia parameter, Afro parameter. So then you can compare the very same questions all over the world where the uh, Eurasia is standing uh, compared to other world regions. We have uh, many topics, economic evaluations, trust in institution, participation in elections, meaning of democracy, COVID, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, my task is now to talk about political uh, behavior and political attitudes. And as you can see, uh, we are studying political capital, uh, interest in politics, and we can see that the highest level of political interest we found in Russia with uh, altogether 56% last November. In Moldova, Ukraine, Armenia, Kazakhstan, Georgia, roughly the same share of about 40%. In Kyrgyzstan a bit less. Uh, another element of political capital, as you know, is to discuss politics with your friends and your family. And uh, as you can see, the most active discussions with your friends and family took place in Armenia, Georgia, and Caucasus. In Russia, 25, 21% uh, of respondents said we are discussing this within my family and friends. In Ukraine, 15%, and in Central Asia, much less in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. <clears throat> uh, one important uh, issue is um, political trust. Uh, and uh, we asked uh, for the trust in different political and uh, other institutions. Uh, what is the standard um, result is the trust is highest in this area in the army and in the police. So the army has a trust of more than 80% in Caucasus, uh, in Russia, 80% in Ukraine, 70%. The trust in the president or prime minister is also rather high. So we have um, uh, very high levels of trust in Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, uh, but only 60% in Russia are trusting the Russian president, 40% don't. Trust in the police is also quite high in uh, Caucasus and uh, in Central Asia. It's not very high in uh, Russia with 46% and Ukraine with 34%. 
The local government is supported by about half the population on average in Eurasia, in Russia, one third of the Russian population is trusting the local government. Civil service is supported by the majority of respondents in, uh, in Caucasus and Central Asia, uh, less so in Russia and in Ukraine. The national government uh, has a high level of trust in Central Asia, a majority, but uh, in Russia, only 40% uh, trust the uh, national Russian government in November last year. Trusting parliament is high in Kazakhstan and rather high in Georgia, but rather low in Russia. Only 24% of Russians trust the Duma. And the trust in courts is about 30% on average, only in Kazakhstan is uh, much higher. Uh, one third of Russians trust the Russian legal system, two thirds do not. And uh, the trust in the internet is high in Kazakhstan and uh, relatively high in Kyrgyzstan, so Central Asia, but uh, only 20% of Russians trust the social media, if they have any. And political parties uh, are supported on average by about one third. And in Russia, it's uh, only 23%. <clears throat> then we asked about voting. And you can see that uh, we have uh, about 50-60% uh, in uh, Caucasus who vote at all elections. Uh, in Russia, only 40%, altogether 60% voted at some point. So 40% of Russians uh, did not vote uh, recently. In Ukraine, it's similar with 70%. Then expressing your opinion about politics and government is uh, rather low because it's uh, in some countries dangerous to express your opinion about the government. So we have in Russia, 60% say, I never talk about politics. Uh, and um, also in Central Asia, many people don't talk publicly about uh, politics. Whereas in Ukraine and Moldova, 60% are expressing their opinion at, at one point or another. So there is a, a difference between Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova on one hand and the other countries on the other. Then uh, we asked, uh, did you contact uh, public officials? And we have about 30% um, of Ukrainians who contacted public officials. In Russia, it's about 30%. Uh, but the big majority is not uh, contacting public officials in the political systems. Then we asked, did you join demonstrations and strikes? And not surprisingly, 95% of Russians say I did not join because, as we know, if you join a strike or demonstration in Russia, this might be bad for your health. Um, but we have in Moldova about 20% who uh, joined these public demonstrations. In Armenia, also 20%. In Georgia, similar. In, in Ukraine, about uh, 10%. Then we asked about satisfaction with uh, the way democracy is uh, working in your country. And uh, we can see that um, uh, only about 10% are very satisfied with democracy in the country. And then we have about one third who are uh, fairly satisfied, but the big majority is not satisfied with the way democracy is working in these countries. <coughs> If you look at the satisfaction with the president or prime minister, it's uh, rather high in Central Asia, uh, but uh, only one third. In Russia, one third of Russians are satisfied with the prime minister, uh, with the, sorry, with the president. Uh, so two thirds of Russians don't are not satisfied with the performance of the Russian president in October, November last year. But also in Moldova and Ukraine, the uh, trust uh, satisfaction in the president or prime minister is not very high. Uh, then we ask uh, the battery uh, of GBS, uh, is our country a full democracy or is it not a democracy? Only 10% uh, on average say our country is a full democracy. In, in Moldova, um, it's even less. 
In Russia, 8% of Russians say our country is a full democracy, but the big majority is saying it's either not a democracy or a democracy with major problems in most of these countries. Then uh, we ask uh, the, the uh, citizens, how democratic is uh, your own country on, on scale between zero and 10? 10 means it's uh, a very good democracy. And we can see that um, in Central Asia, this uh, democracy score is uh, rather high, about six to seven. In the middle, we have Georgia, Ukraine, and Armenia with uh, five. And in Russia, the Russians are saying, um, uh, that the democracy is uh, not uh, is in the middle between undemocratic and democratic. The estimation of democracy in uh, with in, the, in America is that uh, respondents in uh, Armenia, Ukraine, and Georgia think uh, America is a, a very good democracy, whereas in Russia, much less people think that oh, USA is a successful democracy. <clears throat> now uh, we talk about this meaning of democracy. What do you understand by democracy in these countries? So one is the meaning of freedom and liberty. And uh, you can see that uh, about one third in uh, Kyrgyzstan and Ukraine and Moldova and Russia say people can uh, express their political views openly. Uh, one third of Russians say well, we can speak open, but two, th two thirds are saying otherwise. Then the, the freedom of association to organize groups. Uh, here we have uh, also about one third who say this is important for democracy. In, in Russia, it's only 17%. Then freedom of media is important, about one third in many countries in Russia, 24%. And the freedom to demonstrate is very estimated in Kyrgyzstan, Georgia, Ukraine, Armenia, Moldova, but not in Russia. Only 20% say this is part of democracy to have uh, the, uh, the freedom of demonstrations and protest. Uh, another meaning of democracy, which we found uh, under the leadership of Professor Yun Han Chu in many uh, world regions is good governance. So many of these countries have this tradition from the Soviet Union that the government has to provide health services, social services, etc. So in Russia, 40% say the uh, system is a good democracy when they have a good welfare state, pension, unemployment benefits, etc. This is uh, the highest in Russia. It's uh, lower in other countries. About one third say it's important that the government delivers public service to the welfare state. Uh, only one third say uh, democracy has to be free of corruption. In Russia, one third, the same in other countries. So two thirds of the citizens in these countries think it's not so uh, important for our democracy to be free of corruption. Another meaning of uh, democracy is social equality. Uh, many respondents don't believe that uh, uh, the task of the state is to reduce the inequality. So only 20% in most of the countries say uh, the task of the government is to reduce this inequality. Uh, but uh, we have uh, Shea who's saying the basic uh, necessities like food and clothes should be provided. This is about one third of people saying this is an essential part of democracy in our countries. 40% <clears throat> of Russians say the government has the task to ensure jobs for all. Uh, this is the highest in Russia with 40%. Uh, in other countries, it's between 20 and 30%. <clears throat> and uh, one third of uh, the Russians are saying it's important that the state uh, pays unemployment benefits. And now we're coming almost to the end. Uh, norms and procedures. So norms and procedures is meaning of democracy. Uh, here we have uh, about one third in Ukraine, in Kyrgyzstan, in Georgia, in Moldova, who are saying um, uh, this is very important to have uh, free and fair elections. And um, 
In Russia, this figure is much lower. Okay, so this is my last slide. <coughs> the most important uh, feature of democracy uh, in this uh, Eurasian area is People are free to take part in demonstration and protests. This is mostly in Moldova and Georgia, in Ukraine. Uh, and people are free to express their political views in similar countries. And government provides people with uh, public services. This is more prevalent in Russia and in Central Asia. Okay, with this, I would like to conclude my uh, presentation. I hope I was within the time limit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, now you've been joined by the director of the Global Barometer Survey, Professor Yunhan Chu, and I would like to give him the floor to uh, uh, welcome our participants and the speakers uh, who conducted the Eurasia Barometer Study. Eurasia Barometer Study is a part of the GBS, so it's a very important project for us, and we are very happy to uh, welcome Professor Chu uh, today with us. Uh, thank you, uh, Senia. Um, uh, I, first of all, I, I would like to apologize for being uh, late. Uh, I ran into some strange uh, technical difficulty <laughs> earlier, so it took me a while to figure out how to, uh, you know, join you online appropriately. Anyway, uh, speaking on behalf of the Global Barometer Survey, uh, I would like to uh, number one, welcome you all to this uh, uh, GBS uh, web, web, uh, uh, webinar. Uh, and today's topic, uh, I couldn't think of something more important and more timely. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, the, the, the empirical finding that we are uh, listening uh, today it's based on uh, the latest way of Eurasia Barometer Survey, which is part of the uh, Global Barometer Survey family. Uh, and this is the first time that a GBS module has been applied to this important region uh, in its entirety. So finally, you know, we will be able, able to establish the baseline data for Eurasia region so that uh, it can be compare with uh, Latino barometer, uh, Asian barometer, uh, Afro barometer, and, and Arab barometer, the, the, the four remaining uh, regional barometer of the, the uh, uh, TBS uh, Federation. Uh, and this is a very uh, unusual, I would say extraordinary uh, exercise. Uh, Bill, we all suffer from the COVID-19 pandemic, which, you know, create all kind of chaos um, and difficulty in every society. So these survey, you know, they are, they have, they have been uh, implemented under the most difficult situation, uh, as one can imagine. So I really want to congratulate uh, Professor Christian Hoffer and he, his, uh, team you know in the region that managed to uh to successfully implement the survey and deliver this very precious very precious data uh another uh i think important thing to point out that uh, for quite a while uh this region you know known as the former uh, soviet union right um sitting on from one point of view, sitting on the fringe of Europe or, or on the periphery of uh, Europe and didn't get the due attention it deserved. But now uh, we suddenly realize that this region uh, can be, um, you know, the, the, the center of gravity of the entire Eurasia continent <laughs> with this ongoing conflict, right? in Russia and Ukraine, these two important countries which are covered you know, by uh, the, the present survey. I think that's extraordinary, you know. Uh, so I, I think uh, the data and the finding will get uh, a lot more attention than uh, it used to be the case. Uh, so once again, I really uh, appreciate, you know, that we have this opportunity to 
uh, collaborate with uh, 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 with you know the, our colleague uh, around the world. And thank you for you know uh, Professor Christian Harper to lead the presentation. And we have quite a few other important and illuminating uh, presentation to follow. And I don't want to use up you know the, too much time. Uh, one more time, uh, you know I, I want to welcome you all. Uh, including panelists, but also those uh, registered audience uh, viewer uh, uh, that join us, you know, from from around the world, uh, and this is truly global uh, gathering. You know, we 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 probably admit people from uh, you know so many different uh, time zones. So we have to pick up this uh, uh, this uh, time slot, which uh, I, I believe that satisfy most people's schedule. Okay, uh, that's that's it. <laughs> Please, Senia. Thank you so much, Yun Han. So we can carry on with the program of our uh, presentations. Um, as a matter of fact, the second uh, presentation is supposed to be delivered by myself today. I'm uh, multitasking in several roles, combining uh, the um, task of the moderator, but also I was a vice director of this study, and I would like to share very briefly with you um, overview of some more findings on other questions beyond what already was presented by Christian. So I would like actually to pick up on the first uh, presentation. Uh, Christian spoke about different understandings, ex expectations from democracies that exist in this region. And as we have already seen in some societies, it is exactly the outcomes rather than the procedures of democracy that are desired to the public. And uh, such uh, situations, um, are somewhat dangerous as in uh, this case a non-democratic regime might be actually supported by population as long as it can deliver the desired outcomes and hence the support for democracy becomes shallow or undermined and to study these issues in the eurasia barometer survey we also ask a number of patients about uh, respondents attitudes to autocracy and various elements of autocratic governance so first of all, when we asked about the regime preference only in three countries, that is Georgia, Ukraine, and Armenia, 50% or more citizens indicated that democracy is always preferable. In Moldova, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Russia, it is at least a sort of respondents who say that, well, sometimes autocracy actually might be more suitable or even better. And important information related to this would be for us to know whether favoring autocracy um, those fair in autocracy are getting more or less numerous over time. And for this, we split the sample by four generations. We can see here quite different trends. There's a consistent trend of growing share of supporters of democracy in Ukraine. Similar to this, there is also a consistent trend of growing share of supporters of autocracy in Armenia. Interesting are cases also of Georgia and Russia. In Georgia, the youngest generation seem to be showing a somewhat high appreciation of autocracy as compared to their parents and grandparents. But on the other side, in Russia, the last generational group, the opposite, is more supportive of democracy. This new generation is a quite curious case for us. First of all, this is the youngest group. They have more chances to participate in building their country's future. But also, this is the generation which grew up and was socialized already after the dissolution of the Soviet Union in the new conditions of their independent state. So that's particularly of interest for us scientifically. So what is it that the Eurasian public finds most or less attractive about autocracies? We offered our respondents a set of statements asking them to agree or disagree with them. And the countries here are ranked by the cumulative support of various elements of autocracy. So you can see that the highest the support is in Kyrgyzstan and Armenia and the lowest in Georgia and Ukraine. The most popular element of autocratic governance is the ultimate strong leader. This indicator is widely used in other surveys, so I'm sure most of you have seen it in other surveys, such as the World Value Survey or similar. The second most important claim was that as long as the government can deliver order and stability, it doesn't matter whether the government is democratic or not. And the third most popular statement was that we need a political leader who can break rules. So the most popular claims of support for autocracy can be boiled down to a desire for an outcome, regardless of the norms and procedures that were followed to deliver this outcome. Basically, as long as the system works, it doesn't matter if it's democratic or not. And all these uh, many variables, they load very well on one factor, which allows us to develop an index of support for autocracy. And here you can see the country's ranking. 
What is uh, now curious is to go back to the group of citizens who said that they do not mind in which regime to live. If they don't mind, is it possible that they are some secret supporters of democracy? For, as we know, for example, in some countries in the region, democratically oriented citizens are suppressed, and maybe they didn't wish to reveal their true political identity in a survey. Well, it appears this is not the case, and those who said that the regime doesn't matter to them, in fact, have a much stronger pronounced sympathies with autocracy. And another phenomenon that we can observe here in this slide is the so-called illiberal interpretation of democracy. So in the countries in the bottom right corner, you can see that the index of pro-autocratic support has approximately the same value, regardless of the regime choice made by the respondent. This means that in these societies, autocratic elements are perceived as accept acceptable also by the proponents of democracy. And this re result results in the spread and support for the illiberal notion of democracy. Uh, beyond the generation, powerful factors that influence our political orientations are, of course, education and information environment. And education-wise, uh, the gap can be very large, like in the example of Russia. This is in the lower part of the slide. Or it can be quite modest, like in Kyrgyzstan, but the trend persists across all societies that both secondary and tertiary education, they contribute to the reduction of pro-autocratic orientations. With the information environment, we can here distinguish between two major groups. The respondents just to name one single source of information, this serves as the main one for them to learn about politics. And here we can see that access to internet, exp uh, exp uh, exposure to the pluralism of opinions has some positive effect and reduces uh, uh, support for autocracy. Uh, the opposite to this, television has greater chances to be affected by state propaganda, like in the case of Russia, for example. Hence, the TV audience shows greater sympathies with the strong leader and other autocratic elements. Support for autocratic alternatives is likely to be positively associated with the dissatisfaction with the current government and uh, economic inequality, feeling of social injustice. When we asked our respondents whether they think income distribution in their countries was fair, only in one country, in Kazakhstan, we have majority of respondents agreeing with this. The opposite to this in Ukraine and Moldova, it is only one out of 10 persons who agree that incomes are distributed fairly. Of course, there are some correlations with the respondents' own social and economic standing, and you can see that respondents in Kazakhstan have, uh, for example, higher estimated their economic well-being, while those in Russia and Ukraine the lowest. Subjective perceptions of inequality do not always overlap with the objective indicators, such as, for example, the Gini coefficient. According to it, and this is a small chart in the bottom of the screen, majority of countries belong to a group with so-called relative equality, and only Georgia and Russia has a somewhat uh, those indicators. However, perceptions of inequality are also closely linked with the perceptions of corruption, particular political corruption. And for example, in Ukraine and Moldova, where citizens the most believe that income distribution is unfair, also the perceptions of corruption are the highest. 80 to 90 of respondents, basically it's nine out of 10 persons, believe that there is a lot of corruption in both national and local government bodies. And as you might remember from the first presentation, Ukraine, Moldova, and Russia were the three countries with the smallest amount of political trust, so Russia beyond the president, of course. This is uh, the direct effect of higher corruption and inequality. Uh, as higher corruption and uh, higher perceptions of inequality, they undermine trustworthiness and legitimacy of political institutions and system as a whole. And uh, citizens' perception of corruption, now a survey, they are quite consistent with the findings of Transparency International, which show us the situation is somewhat better in Georgia. Armenia and Kazakhstan, and Lorsa in Moldova, Russia, and Ukraine, and only for Kyrgyzstan, we have here somewhat different results. Our subjective assessment of own economic standing uh, as, an, as a result, uh, perceptions of inequality might have worsened a little bit over time as a consequence of the corona pandemic, because our story was conducted at the time when the uh, consequences of uh, the pandemic, well, pandemic was either still ongoing or the consequences were still quite strong. And here we can see that most common problem experienced by Eurasian public during or as a result of the pandemic was exactly the decrease of the household income. At least a third was affected in Armenia and about half of respondents in other countries. Uh, disruption of children's education was a big issue in Moldova, Kyrgyzstan, and a small extent in Russia, Armenia. Serious illness or death in the family 
was a major issue in Central Asia and affected about a fifth of the population in the rest of countries. And similar to this uh, was the situation with the job loss on average one in five respondents reported this problem across all countries. Uh, government's actions on the other side during the pandemic received the highest praise in Kazakhstan. It is the only country where over the half of respondents were actually satisfied with the actions of their government. And the less satisfied were uh, citizens in Ukraine and Moldova. And finally, uh, at the very end of our survey, we also asked our respondents how they see the role of major powers, the European Union, United States, China, and Russia, and how these uh, major powers influence the world. And uh, I must say the data was collected in November 2021, so before the uh, outbreak of the war. Correspondingly, some of these attitudes might have changed over time. Uh, but nevertheless, they give us some ideas about the perceptions of different countries in Eurasia and how they um, uh, guide uh, attitudes of uh, public in these countries uh, today. So most positive in the region is perceived the instance of the European Union, that's about 70% of our respondents on average in the region say so. This varies from vast majority of population in Kyrgyzstan, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine to just about a third of those in Russia. The second most positive was seen the role of China. On average, 64% of public in the region, so two thirds, perceive China as primarily positive. There is some agreement on this in most countries, except for Georgia, where only about a third of respondents agree to that. In case of China, many respondents selected middle positions, so somewhat positive, somewhat negative, meaning that some citizens might be not that well informed about the particular activities and projects of China abroad. Finally, about 61% on average across the region see the role of the United States positive and about 59% so very close to that see the role of Russia positive. Again, this was in November 21. And here on the example of these last two countries, we can see greater polarization between attitudes of Russian respondents to the United States on one hand and perceptions of Russia and Georgia and Ukraine on the other hand. That is it from my side. I tried to make it very quickly. Uh, with this, we finish also overview, uh, cross-country overviews of uh, our survey. And now I will give the floor to three speakers uh, who uh, did the data collection in their country. So these are the main stars of our today events, thanks to whom we have all the data. We will start with Kazakhstan with Dr. Botagos Rakisheva from the Public Opinion Research Institute. She will share with us in more details the findings for Kazakhstan and maybe will uh, help us to understand better those cross-country trends which we have observed. Thank you. Hello from Kazakhstan. My name is Batagos Rakusheva. I'm former um, founder of Public Opinion Research Institute. Um, me and my colleague, I said, and me, uh, prepare the presentation about internet and social networks in the information space of Kazakhstan. Uh, social and political attitudes, the format, second, uh -huh. uh, social and political attitudes are formed under the influence of various factors. One of the important factors, the internet, social network and messages. In the Central Asia countries, uh, the internet and mobile communications is uh, being actively developed, becoming one of the elements of everyday, everyday life. One of problems is that at least almost half of the Central Asia population live in rural and uh, remote areas where access to the internet is not regular. Yeah, the highest level of con conception is uh, uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, 82 percent, the lowest completion in the Turkmenistan, 33%. The speed of mobile internet in Kazakhstan is growing every day. We have felt this, especially during uh, the period of quarantine, when the internet was most demand by the population. As well, uh, as we can see is diagram, respondents not the contact use of the internet in Kazakhstan and, and, uh, and Kyrgyzstan. The younger the respondents, the more they use the internet. 
the popular, the most popular social networks and messengers, uh, WhatsApp, Instagram, YouTube uh, in Kazakhstan. In the picture on the right, user views about social networks. If we look in the age context, when we see what TikTok is more popular among young respondents. Urban and uh, rural uh, residents equally use uh, WhatsApp, uh, Instagram, uh, YouTube, um, and Facebook. Memes. The internet development has accurately affected the growth of memes, especially during the coronavirus pandemic. Memes is a manifestation of folk art in the fast virtual space, help to reduce the level of stress during the uh, quarantine. It should be not um, that internet means uh, in the, uh, indicators of social reaction and way of understanding social process. The study of memes allows a better understanding of needs and problems of the internet audience. The role of social media uh, was high during the coronavirus period when citizens learned about the COVID-19 pandemic, mostly from internet, of course. Here I, uh, here are, uh, the results of survey in seven countries what uh, conducted by, by our institute and commissions by CAREC and uh, Asian, Asian Development Bank during the quarantine period. The survey results show what the majority of respondents search and read information from media and social networks. Most often respondents use the internet to connect with people, about 90%. Approximately 20% use the internet to search for political news and information. 50% of respondents use internet um, to organize, to, uh, to influence politics. 25% respondents use to, uh, the internet to express um, the political opinions. One of the element of political uh, leave of society is a signature of petitions. The phenomenon, this phenomenon petitions uh, uh, is new to Kazakhstan society. According to the results of World Value Survey six and seven wives, Few respondents uh, submit uh, the petitions, but we see an increase from two to five percent. In Kazakhstan, the draft law on petitions and by being activity discussed, several uh, platforms have been um, opened uh, that collect petitions. The society is more actively involved in signate uh, petitions on various issues. The most important the most important uh, sources to find information about politics and government at television and uh, the internet. Um, in this context, television and internet are important for age groups. Uh, the traditional source of information is television, um, even during periods of crisis and uh, cataclysm. Political activity in Kazakhstan has been growing in recent years. Various factors have influenced political behavior, changes of leadership of the country, reboot of the political system, social and economic transformation. Generation, generational change was also an important factor. Now, citizens born after independence uh, make up half of population in Kazakhstan, and this change leads to transformation in values and attitudes. And of course, the internet will affect of all aspects of uh, Kazakhstan society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Protagos. It's very interesting. Pardon the uh, use of media, internet use. Uh, we will now pass the floor to Dr. Hejin Manasan, who will talk about uh, Believe Democratic Attitude in Armenia. Dr. Manasan is the Director Emerita at CRC Armenia. She's also a Vapor National Representative in Armenia. And she was the initiator of the study in Armenia. Please, Hedjun, the floor is yours. You can start sharing your screen. 
and you need to unmute yourself. Thank, yeah, 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 I, I did. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ksenia. I am looking to get the file to share. Aha, here it is, okay. So, hello everyone. Uh, though <laughs> Xenia and uh, Christian already covered a lot <laughs> on Armenia as well, but I still uh, will be moving forward uh, to tell a bit more details on Armenia, uh, on perceptions and attitudes. And uh, I will agree very much uh, uh, with uh, Yan Han Chu. Uh, professors who said that this is the beginning and the data will be used. Uh, while conducting other surveys, quite often uh, in the questions that contain the word of democracy, always uh, during the presentations, experts or uh, attendees were asking, do people understand what does it mean democracy? So this survey uh, clarifies quite well all the components of democracy and uh, really it is worth attention and I do believe that many papers, blogs and uh, other written pieces will appear which will uh, keep people uh, more aware, increase their awareness, etc. So uh, uh, what I did first, I looked for the democracy index that was recently published uh, by the Economic Intelligence Unit, just to figure out uh, how Armenia stands and uh, in comparison with uh, neighboring countries. And here you can see uh, that um, Armenia's uh, scoring is not bad. It, it is considered to be hybrid regime country uh, and it is increasing we'll see uh, on the next slide but uh, it is very important to uh, check uh, which are the most contributors uh, of this overall democracy score so electoral processes and pluralism uh, quite high and uh, political participation again if it is voting in elections, again, quite high. Uh, functioning of government, uh, again, not bad, but less than electoral processes and pluralism. And the worst score is the political culture. So uh, such um, studies also are very important uh, to compare, triangulate with the uh, Eurasia barometer findings, world value survey findings, etc. So, uh, what was the dynamics for Armenia? Why I decided to explore uh, this um, uh, topic uh, perception of democracy? Uh, because uh, quite often you can hear from public officials that democracy becomes Armenia's brand, international brand. <laughs> Maybe they do mean the increase of uh, the scores. Here uh, you can see Armenia is the bold orange line. It is really increasing. Uh, however, it is uh, still <laughs> quite low. If it is in range from uh, up to uh, 10, then uh, we are quite uh, behind uh, of the top. Another source that I looked at, that was Freedom Houses, uh, Freedom in the World uh, 2022. The global expansion of authoritarian rule. I'll not uh, be bringing the citations that I collected, uh, but uh, this report and the previous report uh, state that democracy is uh, slowing down globally. Uh, which is very important message uh, for all the countries, regardless uh, if they are uh, authoritarian ones or... I need to, I needed to increase the screen, sorry, from the very beginning. Uh, regardless of that, uh, they have to look at that. 
so now I'll be turning to the survey conducted in Armenia. The uh, uh, field work was completed by my uh, previous organization, I am proud of very much, which is the Caucasus Research Resource Center Armenia. And the field work and the overall project was coordinated by Lili Tiezekian, uh, the uh, director of research. Um, as already you saw, uh, 1,200 adults in Armenia were uh, uh, interviewed via Kati, via telephones. Therefore, the random digit dialing approach was used. Uh, here is brief description of the interviewees. Uh, quite uh, good gender balance, education, which matches with the overall demography, uh, the same with the age and uh, with the uh, settlement uh, type. So uh, this is uh, quite representative for the country. Uh, coming to the sources, uh, TV and the internet and social media are being the most important sources uh, to learn about politics and the government. Um, another question that I decided to highlight as a context uh, that is the following. What is the most important problem facing this country the problem that the government should address. And uh, this is a very new phenomena. Similar results were obtained via the Caucasus barometer. So war uh, was mentioned, international affairs were mentioned as uh, the top uh, issue for the country. Uh, and interestingly, mm, uh, the government, uh, many believe uh, that uh, the government will be able to solve this issue uh, during the next uh, five years. However, uh, while conducting cross tabulations, um, uh, we found that those who voted during the last elections for the ruling party, they uh, do believe more that the government will be able uh, to solve uh, this issue. Uh, this is for country context in which situation Armenia is and uh, what do people um, care or worry about. Uh, I will skip maybe the characteristics of democracy because it was already shown by Christian. Uh, so the more articulated our uh, uh, freedom to express views and uh, also participation in uh, demonstrations, etc. However, this paternalism perception is uh, uh, existing in Armenia as well. Government ensures jobs, opportunities for all. So this is uh, something uh, that uh, slowly changes, but very slowly. So moving uh, further uh, to the questions that enable assessing the democracy and uh, other countries. Uh, so uh, you can see that about 40% think that um, in Armenia, uh, we have a full democracy or and a democracy, but with minor uh, problems. Meantime, uh, quite large shares of respondents reported that not a democracy or democracy with major problems. Uh, interestingly, uh, those who again voted for the party in power believe that Armenia is um, uh, democratic. They do believe more than the rest. Uh, if assessing uh, from one to four, one being full democracy, four being not uh, democracy, then the average score uh, 
for them was two and seven uh, compared to uh, two and three. Uh, so how satisfied or dissatisfied are you with the way uh, the pattern is quite similar? Uh, those who are uh, very satisfied or fairly satisfied, again, some 45%. Uh, assessing the democracy. Many think that I, I let me to move this to show the, the scores. Um, the mean score, how suitable is democracy for the country in a scale from one to 10 is five and a half. Um, however, those that supported the ruling party in the elections believe the democracy is more suitable for Armenia. The score for them is higher, notably higher. Uh, we tested for gender, settlement type, uh, age differences, but uh, no statistical significance. Uh, again, uh, many uh, think that democracy is preferable. I can't move for some reason. Aha. Uh -huh. So democracy uh, assessed uh, for Armenia and for uh, selected countries, but uh, here uh, I aggregated, uh, grouped uh, those that undemo being undemocratic. Uh, I selected uh, the score from one to three and democratic from eight to 10. It is uneven because the average uh, includes four groups, but still it is comparable for uh, these countries. And um, interestingly for China, uh, I saw that Christian uh, mentioned uh, some seven something that Armenians reported average uh, uh, democracy score. Uh, I found it be, to be uh, close to Russia, even, even uh, less. So the USA is perceived uh, the most uh, among the listed countries, most democratic. Democracy as a value, many strongly agree, even if it has problems, uh, still democracy uh, is the best form of governance. Uh, however, um, you can see that uh, some 70% of uh, respondents say it, that in our country, it needs major change or even replacement. Uh, also, I did try to check uh, the attitudes for a strong man's style. Recently, I uh, went through a book, which is written by Gideon Rachman, the link is uh, here. Uh, so uh, though he is looking, uh, taking care of um, American presidents, uh, comparing their attitudes, but still he uh, uh, portrays uh, what does it mean strong man. This is, if, if <laughs> in one word, this is an authoritarian man that <laughs> can break the rules. Uh, that is why uh, I selected just three statements uh, <clears throat> that Armenian respondents uh, reflected their attitudes. Uh, we should get rid of parliament and elections and have a strong leader uh, decide things. This is one statement. Another country, this country needs a leader who can break the rules if necessary to get things done. And finally, the army should govern the country. So these are autocrats, authoritarian intentions that uh, are uh, quite uh, strongly, I would say the, would, wouldn't say majority, but uh, the portion of those 
who strongly or somewhat agree with this statement is uh, quite large that uh, makes anyone to uh, experience fears uh, for uh, democratic uh, development of the country. Agent, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You have about one minute left because uh, we have I one more speaker. I, I am finished. Thank you. Here. So, so uh, once a strong man is the st that strong man, the current government or the current prime minister, it came out that uh, comes out that uh, it is not. Uh, the votes uh, were almost equal. Uh, meantime, those who are more wealthy across tabulation with the economic status uh, of the respondents um, and uh, favoring or being happy with the current government uh, is, is higher, their shares. They do favor the current government more, wealthy people. And uh, I do believe that that's it. I can't turn the page, I did. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> if there are questions, I am ready. Thank you so much, Heijin. That was really <clears throat> very insightful. And we have today now our fifth presenter, Koka Kapanadze from Gorbi, from Georgia. Koka was the project manager uh, of Eurasia Barometer. He was overseeing the fieldwork. And we are very grateful to him for his agreement to speak at the today's webinar. So please, Koka, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Xenia. And thanks to all the presenters who have shared uh, their data uh, before me. It was really interesting to hear from all of you, especially the cross-country review uh, as a young person uh, who believes firmly believes in the democratic future of Georgia. I was happy to see that majority of population shares the same vision as me, and especially that young people share that vision. Um, uh, understanding of democracy, however, it was one of the major um, highlights that we wanted to present during this topic. So that would be that will be one of the uh, one, one out of three major topics um, uh, of this presentation, um, together with the economic situation of the country, as well as the trust in government. So the uh, my presentation will be divided into these three parts. Um, however, before we delve into the data, um, I wanted to emphasize that um, this is not one of those cases where we have to. Um, we had to adapt um, some sort of theory to um, our work uh, here in Gorby through this project because uh, we've been implementing uh, similar kind of projects during the recent years as well. And we've been asking the same questions in different surveys um, um, in other our, of our projects. So during this presentation, you will also see some comparisons to the data um, with of the same questions of previous years. So it will be interesting to see the pattern, how these attitudes were changing throughout the years. Um, let's start with the economic situation. <laughs> the first question that we wanted to present was uh, the about the economic condition of our country, how um, individuals were evaluating, and these are the results from Eurasia, uh, Eurasia barometer, barometer study. Um, as you can see, um, there's a very few percentage of people who are assessing um, it as very good or good, and around uh, majority of people are saying that um, it's uh, average. Um, and um, in comparison um, to whether economic condition of the family um, is better than what it was a few years ago, um, for majority of the people, it's about the same, according to 2021 data of uh, Eurasia Barometer. Um, and uh, for the next, for 21%, it's a little worse now, and for 20%, it's much worse now. So um, this is um, not, not that many people responding that um, it is either much better or a little better. Um, compared to the data, um, 
the same question and the data of 2019, um, we can see that um, there's a difference in people who are voting, uh, who are um, so stating that it's much better. There's a bit of increase there um, compared to uh, those that responded in 2019. Um, and obviously the COVID-19 factor uh, is one of the biggest uh, reasons for this. Uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, um, Georgia was one of the front runners in uh, of how it's the success story of uh, how we should have handled the COVID-19 crisis. However, this situation got a lot worse and, uh, um, and uh, throughout the several uh, months and years afterwards, we've had many, many, thousands, around thousands cases per day. So COVID-19 has definitely affected um, uh, the general hope whether our country would be better off in the future or not. Um, and this is exactly uh, uh, the the next slide is asks exactly the same question as we can see um, 19, percent and 34 so majority of people uh, think that uh, the economic situation will be a little better or much better and um, this this is uh, uh, in a way connected to the fact that uh, uh, a lot of the emphasis during the corona crisis was drawn to um, making less stricter regulations and uh, making sure that uh, the businesses would get enough support as well as individuals would get enough support and uh, I think the the approximate period of time when we were carrying out the survey was exactly after where the government was issuing certain assistance to individuals as well as there were um, less and less uh, regulations in, in terms of uh, protecting citizens from COVID-19. And um, this is uh, also um, another slide which compares the three years of our three different studies. Um, uh, there, the especially pessimistic view of uh, our country's economic situation, as you can see, is in um, 2020, as there's only 3% who had thought that there, there would be a much better economic situation for our country in the future. Um, while uh, in 2021, these figures are a lot higher and the, the, there is more optimism in, in that regard now in people. Um, the next section that we wanted to, to address is understanding of democracy. Um, as it was pointed out earlier in, in previous slides as well, um, there are uh, four major statements from four major questions that were asked during the survey uh, from 36 to 38. Um, uh, these are these are the percentages that had the, the highest percentages of the responses. So in, in, in the case of one of the questions, uh, most of the Georgians uh, chose that people are free to take part in demonstrations and protests, that that's the most important characteristic of democracy. Um, in another case, it was that media is free to criticize the things government does. Um, government provides people with quality public services and that people are ex uh, free to express their political views openly. So as we can see, um, in, in it, it, it all could be somehow um, uh, united under one big umbrella topic that freedom of expression and uh, freedom of speech is very important for a uh, majority of Georgians. And um, you might have heard about a lot of protests that have been going on um, throughout past several years. Um, some of them uh, may have been um, against certain decisions of the government. Some of them have, might, might have been against certain policies. Uh, but the trend uh, that is also uh, very uh, important to highlight and to mention is that there also has been a lot of collaborative action from the workers. And there have been a few cases where um, strikes have actually um, received uh, very positive outcomes. Uh, for example, um, there was this industrial worker strike in Rustavi where it, during which a pay rise was achieved. Um, also certain um, demands of miners from Giatura, which is one of the cities where mining mostly happens, 
um, it, their, their demands were also met and uh, the city of Batumi um, also was uh, the workers from city of Batumi um, uh, as this, this is a port city and uh, the workers from port, they were granted um, key demands on compensation and labor conditions. And all of these examples that I've just listed right now, these happened in 2021. So throughout this one year, there have been several successful strikes and there seems to be a trend um, in, in, in this regard in Georgia, which is a very positive note and which says a lot about the fact that Georgians can um, not only demand the policy changes, but also um, and um, achieve those results on a national level, but also on local um, levels and uh, low level of their communities, which is a, a definitely positive sign for um, democratic development of our country. Um, when asked about um, whether compared with other systems in the world, would you say our system of governance works fine as it is, needs minor change, needs major change, or should be replaced? As you can see, the majority, 38% um, uh, think that um, it needs major change, 21% um, says that it should be replaced, um, and um, um, 30 percent uh, says that it needs minor change um, and throughout the next couple of slides we're going to um, find out why um, this uh, there there's such uh, statistics and we're moving on to the final section of this presentation which is trust in government um, so I think what we're going to find out in during the next couple of slides and what we also saw in the previous slide is that um, Georgian population is quite polarized in terms of their political preferences and we can see during this slide as well that um, when asked how well do you think the government responds to what people want, 35% um, um, uh, and 1.8, 35% uh, uh, response that they are not very responsive. Um, and 1.8% um, says that uh, it's not responsive at all. Um, and whereas in terms of uh, lar whether they are largely responsive, it's 38% and 5% for very responsive. So it's um, around 45 uh, and 40%, no, no major differences in terms of opini op opinions. Um, and uh, in terms of which institutions they trust here, we can also see that there's quite a, a division, the same kind of division um, between two opposite opinions. Um, however, uh, it com let's, if we compare it again to the data from the previous years, uh, we can see that the trust in uh, national government uh, has been more, more and more in, in increasing. Um, uh, and the uh, same goes for the trust in parliament. Um, as we can see, it's uh, around 40% uh, think that there's quite a lot of trust in 2022, but based on 2022 data. Um, and uh, as for the compared to last year, the indicator was 26. Um, however, on the other hand, we also see that there's 38% of people who believe that there's uh, none, they, they don't have any trust um, compared to uh, 20, which is which comes from the 2019 data, um, which again, um, emphasizes how polarized the Georgian society is. Um, especially bearing in mind the political crisis uh, and the government crisis that uh, happened just recently, which was also um, followed by the e EU um, European Council, Charles Michel sending his envoy to somehow me mediate um, the political differences that existed between different parties in Georgia. And so they could come to some sort of agreement. Um, in, in terms of trust in courts, we can also see that um, there's around 48% uh, uh, overall that have 
uh, trust compared to 40% that have either very little trust or no trust at all. Um, uh, throughout the past several years, they, there have been numerous cases where the society was, again, very much so divided. Um, and in addition to the political crisis, uh, the government crisis that I had mentioned just now, the one of some of the high public, uh, the cases of high public interest, one of one of such cases was the uh, detention of uh, our ex uh, uh, president Mikhail Saakashvili, who was in exile and who decided to secretly come to Georgia um, recently, and that has been one of the big decisions um, uh, that was made uh, by uh, the court uh, quite recently. But apart from that, there have been other um, cases, and in general, the dynamic that we can see is. Uh, which again goes back to and links to the um, the way we understand democracy is that whatever whatever we um, the people in Georgia uh, see as as a prob as problematic or whatever they want to express themselves um, they always do and th this has been very visible um, in mainstream media as well as in the data that we've collected uh, that we are very much keen on um, expressing ourselves and making sure that our freedom of expression is protected um, as much as possible. So that was it from our end. And uh, if you have any questions afterwards, I'll be happy to respond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Koka. That's truly fascinating, very interesting uh, findings, and also a lot of context, additional context that you provided us that is not always um, visible from um, cross-country overviews. So we're a little bit out of time, but nevertheless, we still have uh, about 20 minutes for discussion, for questions and answers. We did not receive any questions in the Q&A or in chat yet. This can be a good sign that all is clear or bad sign that nothing is clear. But the floor is open. I will have raised hand, please, Yunhan. Han. Uh, thank you, Sinia, for recognizing my, <laughs> my uh, hand. Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, Professor Christian Haver, uh, uh, you know, your presentation cover all the seven countries. And I, I'm sure that uh, the data from Russia and Ukraine will uh, draw a lot of attention <laughs> uh, from this point on. And I, I happen to notice that um, on a very revealing indicator, that's uh, satisfaction with the way democracy works in your country, okay? Uh, the citizen in Ukraine uh, uh, gives uh, their country the lowest uh, uh, evaluation as compared to uh, all the seven. Well, uh, Russia is not, you know, the much uh, 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 you know, better. Uh, it's actually uh, the second last. Okay, but but Ukraine. Um, uh, you know, for its profile in the recent uh, uh, you know, conflict, uh, military conflict um, that uh, was uh, has been up upheld by some uh, Western observer as uh, you know uh, as a, a, a functioning or vibrant democracy, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. Apparently, this does not resonate now with our data right uh, as a matter of fact the ukraine people they are the most dissatisfied uh, or disenchanted uh, citizen uh, and, and and almost uh, close to uh as if i remember more than two thirds okay uh, uh they are not happy with the way uh democracy work uh, i believe that you know it has a lot to do with Corruption, a lot of depolarization, especially the division over identity, uh, but also economic um, uh, stagnation, uh, uh, or even uh, you know uh, getting uh, uh, you know worse and worse in terms of income and standard living. Uh, 
uh, I wonder, Professor Christian Haver, would you like to share your view on why um, you know Ukraine uh, was ranked the lowest, you know, by citizen? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you, Professor Yunhan Chu. Uh, I think that um, uh, now when people talk about um, Europe and European democracy in Ukraine. They have somehow a glorified uh, view on the Ukrainian politics. So I think that um, what people in Brussels and in Washington are saying about this theme of democracy is uh, to some point wishful thinking. So uh, this um, this consolidation, uh, uh, which is uh, supposedly in Ukraine, uh, has not happened yet, <clears throat> and uh, we have some uh, signs of democratic improvement, mm -hmm. but the institutions don't have this level of uh, democratic uh, transparency and compliance yet. <clears throat> so I think there's much to be done, uh, but um, at the moment it's more at, at the level of uh, democratic hope, uh, not democratic reality. So there are there are problems with corruption, there are problems with uh, the economy, there are problems, uh, that's why the Ukrainian population is not uh, standing 90% uh, behind the government, but now of course things have changed. And we have to uh, study also different parts of Ukraine. We have to study different um, regions and different uh, age groups, generations. So we are at the moment at the beginning of analyzing it. And um, it's not the case that Ukraine is now an idle type of democracy and uh, has to join the European Union. It's on the way, <clears throat> it's on the way, but uh, on a good way and it needs support. But um, uh, this would be my assessment. Thank you very much, Christian. So a reminder that the floor is open for your questions and or if you would like to say a comment, just please raise your hand and I will give you an opportunity to speak. Uh, I would like to add that uh, specifically regarding Ukraine that probably our respondents um, when answering, they think uh, not only about the satisfaction with the way democracy works, but also the way how the political system is functioning currently in their country. And this is in a way different, this normative idea of democracy. Of course, Ukraine enjoys a high level of uh, freedom, individual freedom and civil liberties as comparing to some neighboring countries. But uh, the political system, the institutions, there is high level of corruption. So there are many things for improve. And this uh, high level, low level of satisfaction with the democracy works, uh, I think in my view, uh, addresses specifically the weaknesses of the political system, but not uh, the satisfaction with the democracy as an ideal type. So we have got some questions in chat still about democracy. Younger people in Ukraine are more democratic than the elders. What does our data say? Uh, yes, I think this was in uh, my presentation where we looked at different generations that the youngest generation in Ukraine, they are indeed more pro-democratic. So there is a positive trend in terms of growing support of democracy across generations. Yes, I think what we found out is uh, it's very important for democratic uh, values uh, to be uh, younger. Uh, and to have a higher level of education and uh, to uh, live in an urbanized space. So these social groups in cities, higher education and youth are the, uh, the basis of democratic values in Ukraine. Okay, how about this 
service conducted, we got another question, how the service conducted during the pandemic was some challenges of doing this kind of field work. So I invite all colleagues, Georgia, Armenia, Kazakhstan, to share briefly your insights. Uh, I think in the very first presentation, we have shown a table. Uh, most services were conducted face-to-face. -face. We had telephone service in Russia, in Georgia, and in Armenia, exactly because of the reasons of the pandemic. But uh, Ukraine, Moldova, and Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan did it face to face. About the challenges, please, dear colleagues, if you can share anything. Which challenges did you experience in your countries? Um, I can okay. jump in on this. Oh, if you want to go first, uh, okay. Um, well, uh, in terms of uh, telephone surveys, um, it, it has actually changed uh, in a way that since a lot of people were at home, uh, they were, uh, there were uh, less response rates uh, in, uh, in that regard because they, a lot of them were um, responding more easily as they had more time and it was something i mean unusual for them to do so but um in, it, in terms of face-to-face -face data collection yeah there was a significant decrease in response rates and there were a lot of declines so that was from our end we we were very um lucky uh, Corby, to had um, the telephone panel uh, a rep nationally representative telephone panel and um, that is why switching to um, such kind of methods not only in, in this case but in many other of our surveys has been um, more we, we felt more confident in doing that so um, that was the only change in, in that. We also wanted to share um, we uh, conducted uh, in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan the survey uh, there were uh, 1,200 uh, 1, 200, uh, respondents in each country. And actually, we uh, conducted the service uh, uh, by the face-to-face -face method. Actually, uh, during the period of the survey, uh, there were no restrictions because of the pandemic. So uh, then there were no such big problems or some uh, circumstances during the survey um, yeah, uh, in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan as well. So uh, almost covered my colleagues, <laughs> Koka and uh, Botagos. Uh, the, the same is the situation in Armenia. Uh, and uh, the CRRC switched to the uh, CATI methods uh, quite early. Even uh, the CRRC conducted a couple of uh, surveys specifically uh, regarding uh, the COVID uh, to see the perceptions, the behavior of population, and the first survey results were even submitted to the government. Uh, so you uh, simply uh, need to <laughs> dial, dial, and dial. The only thing that is important you to keep the proportions of the population as much as possible via this random digit dial uh, method. Uh, that's it. The response rate is much lower than it is uh, when you conduct face-to-face -face survey, but that's the reality is and. Uh, Vapor uh, had a seminar uh, showing that the differences are not uh, much, depending on the mode. If I am not mistaken, Xenia, please confirm. Yes, please, Christian. Uh, yes, uh, just to inform you, we did uh, telephone interviewing in Armenia, Georgia, and Russian Federation in three countries. And in the others, in Kazakhstan, in Kyrgyzstan, in Moldova, and Ukraine, we managed to do face-to-face -face interviews. This was also not easy because of restrictions. Uh, and uh, that's why it took also some time. But we managed to have face-to-face -face interviews on those countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we had one more question. Why did people rate China's level of democracy almost at the same level as the United States on world basis? Was it in the Armenian or Georgian presentation? I don't remember. So if anybody would like to comment on this. 
uh, that that was, I guess, the aggregate uh, presentation. Uh, in my data, I when I compared, uh, China has the lowest uh, score, then Russia, then uh, Armenia, and then USA. USA being the highest. China's score, according to the data that I had at my disposal, were some four and uh, half, something like that even lower compared to Russia. Thank you very much, Hedgen. Well, one possibility can be that citizens uh, judge about the democracies in other countries based on their own experience in their home countries. So if their own home countries, um, not particularly democratic, but nevertheless presents itself as a democracy, they make uh, extend these conclusions also to neighboring countries such as China. So we are close to an end. If there are any final questions or final remarks or anything, please raise your hand or speak up. There was a question about the contacts of the participants. Uh, some of them were included into the presentations and the presentations will be shared as PDF files via the Vapor website. Otherwise, you can write to Rene Rice, a Vapor executive director, and she can uh, then um, uh, share with you the email addresses of the participants. Those of them, uh, because uh, two of our presenters today, Dr. Rakishev and Dr. Manasan, they're national representatives of Vapor. So if you're a member of Vapor, you are likely to have their contact details. But otherwise, Rene should be able to share those. Okay, so we seem to have no questions and nobody's willing to speak. Thank you very much for attendance. Many thanks for all presenters for your excellent presentations, very insightful. Thank you very much for all those in attendance, for your questions, for the discussion. It was really a pleasure to uh, see you all at this webinar and I hope to see you at the next events in future. I would like especially to thank Professor Chu for joining despite the very late uh, hour in Taiwan and many thanks to Global Barometer Survey and Academia Sinica for their support with this study. Maybe we should give Professor Yunhan Chu as director of the GBS group the uh, last word. Professor Yunhan Chu, you want to make a final statement? Maybe there is some technical issue. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, I would like to say that the same questions which we asked here in these Eurasia countries uh, have been asked or will be asked in Asia Barometer, in Afro Barometer, in Arab Barometer, Latino Barometer. So uh, at, at some point in the next few months, you can compare the political values in Kazakhstan, Ukraine, with those in the Middle East, uh, South America, and uh, Taiwan, uh, Japan, etc. So it's it's a big comparative study organized by Professor Yun Han Chu. Lovely. Um, yeah. Uh, speaking on behalf of the. Uh... Global Parameter Survey, I, I want to uh, expect my thanks to all the panelists, uh, and especially to uh, Senia. Uh, she, you know, uh, single-handedly uh, organized this event uh, behind the curtain. So uh, again, you know, I recognize her relentless effort, you know, in putting together this wonderful program. And I'm sure that uh, many of our viewers uh, benefit a great deal from uh, your illuminating presentation, but I believe this is simply the first cut of uh, 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 analysis of this rich data set. Uh, in the following months, I, I believe that um, you know we will uh, be able to learn more from you uh, with uh, further analysis, especially with. Uh, with uh, cross-regional comparison, you know, that will yield even more interesting finding. Uh, thank you all, yeah. Thank you very much all, and uh, we reached the end, so have a good
afternoon or the rest of the day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.